What sort of world are we living in when an 85-year-old woman dies in her own home because of flood water in the UK? Well, look, all those specific cases obviously are terrible uh, and the emergency service are working incredibly hard in the parts of the country, whether in Scotland or in England, to deal with the response to flooding. Uh, thousands of homes have been protected um, by the flood defences that are in place, but clearly individual cases are, are a tragedy and people's sympathies are obviously with people's families. It's going to get worse, apparently. Well, there's more rain, I think, forecast later in the week. The Environment Agency, and you'll have seen from those flood warnings, has very good systems to warn people uh, about what's going to happen so that people know what to expect and can take the um, appropriate steps. And local councils with the, the um, local resilience forums they have, which is where they work with all the emergency services to protect people, are in place. And they've been working incredibly hard over the weekend. And I know they'll continue to do so in the days to come. Are you happy with the flood defences as they are at the moment? Well, I think we've put a lot of money into flood defences over the last few years. 22,000 properties, I think, were protected from the flooding that's taken place, but there's always more you can do, um, and we're working very hard. I know the Floods Minister was out yesterday looking at some of the flood defences that were in place, but people are working incredibly hard across the country, as you've seen from that report, and we'll continue to do so. I know you want to talk to me about buses this morning, but local buses can't run through water, can they? Well, no, obviously not, and this storm obviously was a very um, severe storm, and I think the transport system obviously is impacted when you have this sort of amount of weather that falls in a short space of time. Um, and again, our transport systems will have recovered from it. You know, at the weekend I was impact on the train services I use, but Network Rail was out there working really hard, getting the services back up and running again. But of course there is going to be disruption when you get this level of, of a severe weather event. Mm. Buses? So, look, on the announcement we've set out, it's the first uh, phase of the money that we've saved from cancelling the second phase of HS2. We're putting £150 million into buses across the North and the Midlands. That's the first down payment on a billion pounds for buses. And across the country, people will see us from next week extending the £2 bus fare cap, which was going to go up to £2.50 next week, and using the money we've saved from cancelling the second phase of HS2, we can keep it at £2 all the way through next year. It's a real boost to people's cost of living. OK, and um, there's always more you can do, you said, as far as flooding um, defences is concerned. Do you have anything in mind in particular? Well, look, we've con we continue to invest money in improving flood defences across the country, and I was looking at the, the various maps yesterday. There's 22,000 properties protected uh, that wouldn't have been before the investment that we've made. We'll continue investing in our flood defences across the country to better protect people from these extreme weather events. OK. Uh, what's your reaction to the chants on UK streets of jihad? Well, I saw some of those clips yesterday and they were very disturbing. Um, the Home Secretary, I know, is talking to the police. The police are rightly operationally independent. We expect them to use the full force of the law that's available that's um, to problem, deal with those it? sorts of things. Well, look, the Home Secretary will have those conversations uh, with the police and will continue to do so. We urge them to use the full force of the law, um, but, but rightly in our country, they're operationally independent. They don't follow the instructions of, of politicians. They're operationally independent. They have to make those decisions themselves. But the Public Order Act and the terrorism legislation, the police are saying, um, meant that they couldn't do anything about that at the weekend. Well, I don't know about the specific circumstances. That is a decision for them. But, look, we've strengthened the public order policing over the last year. You know, that was controversial at the time, but we've strengthened those powers. And the police also have the full range of counter-terrorism powers available to them. They have which to use... Which they, any use at the weekend? Well, they have to use those to the... the use the full force of the law. Do you think the, we should check, look the, at the law again? Well, the Home Secretary will have those conversations with the police, as you would expect her to, but they are operationally independent. They and the Crown Prosecution Service have to reach these decisions um, as you would expect them to, and that's, that's not a matter for the government, but the Home Secretary will continue talking to the police as you would expect her to. OK, and what, what's your view on what's going on with um, Transport for London? Suggestions um, that, a, that a train driver was um, spearheading chanting on, on one of our tubes over the weekend. I saw that clip. Uh, and on the face of it, it was disturbing. But I know the British Transport Police and Transport for London are investigating that. And because they're investigating it, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on a, an ongoing police investigation. But they, they took 
that very seriously, and I thank them at the weekend for their vigilance on that matter. Um, but look, I want to make sure that people across the country are feeling secure, and those sorts of things will have been very concerning, particularly to people in the Jewish community. That's why the Prime Minister's made it clear that we stand four square in defending them. That's why we put extra money into the Community Security Trust to enable them to be properly protected and to feel secure on the streets of Britain. As far as the Middle East is concerned, um, we were hearing from Deborah Haynes, she's saying it's like a tinderbox at the moment. How do we help both sides um, get beyond the anger that we can see at the moment? I think that's why you saw the Prime Minister in the region over the last few days, meeting with the Israeli government, but also meeting with the Arab countries surrounding Israel, the President of Egypt, the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, talking about the immediate situation and the need for Israel to defend itself against the Hamas attack, but also, also rightly urging the humanitarian assistance. We saw some trucks getting across the Rafah border crossing into Gaza to protect the innocent Palestinian people who are just as much victims of Hamas as those in Israel. And we have to keep working together. The Prime Minister is demonstrating that leadership with other world leaders um, to try and get to a uh, situation to our long-term situation with a two-state solution. But at the moment, the priority is for Israel. It's got to defend itself from the attack from Hamas. To that end, Lord Dannett, former head of the British Army, as you know, was on the programme last week. He says that the ground invasion should happen sooner rather than later. We're hearing uh, from Washington overnight that um, America is saying, please don't do that yet. We need to try and get the hostages out as best we can. What has the British government done? I don't think it's uh, for us to give advice to Israel about the timing of their defence, but you raise a very important question there about, about the hostages. I think we will have been uh, urging efforts to be taking place to get those hostages out. It was very good news at the weekend, the two that were released. We obviously don't go into that work in detail, but that's why the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary were having those conversations with, not just with the Israeli government, but also uh, Arab governments from the countries surrounding Israel. Should we accept refugees from Gaza? Well, I think reaching for the, 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 the tool of refugees at this stage is not the right one to do. What we should be doing Where is... Where should they go? Well, what we should be doing is putting resources, as we do, we announced more money at the weekend for getting aid into Gaza. We've been urging the opening of the Rafah border crossings to get aid into Gaza to support. Is it something we think about going forward? Well, I think the most important thing is to support people in the region, and that's why we've been urging the Israeli government and the Egyptian government to make sure that aid can get into Gaza. Uh, we saw that the first stages of that at the weekend, and that was very welcome, and we'll continue to, do, to, to urge that, and we'll continue to put our support into helping people on the ground. We're out of time. Transport Secretary, it's good to see you. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Us.